Welcome to today's show. You're what you are and where you are because of what's gone into your mind. You can change what you are and you can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. You cannot become what you need to be by remaining what you are. If you can't take a huge step to begin with, take as big a step as you can. But take it now. That's the key. Take it now. <laughs> you can have everything in life that you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. Today's a brand new day, and it's yours. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am Captain Mark, and I want to welcome you to So What's the Real Truth? Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's your truth, my truth, and then there's the real truth. Today we're going to get to it and we're going to find out exactly what the real truth is about. And I have an exciting show for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a live call-in show. So there's a telephone number right at the bottom of the screen. Get off of your butt and call in. You might as well call in now because the lines are already getting crowded and we want to make sure we get your comment or your question. And today's guest, well, we have, we have a, an election coming up. And you know at the International Stevenson Foundation, we don't, we don't um, try and, and, and promote any candidates, and we're not opposing any candidates, but we want to give you some information. I think that the hottest race in this election on this coming Tuesday is going to be one for the first sub-circuit uh, court position for judge, and we're going to be honored today with a, with a guest that you're going to be surprised to hear some things about. But first, I want you to grab your ink pen and take down some vital information. Why? Because most of you are gutless. Most of you don't have enough guts to call in and, and ask any questions. Most of you have to be prodded. And remember, I cannot hear you talking to your television. You have to pick up your phone and call in. So don't be a coward. Call in and ask the question. Today, next to me, is Judge Marion Ahmad. Is that how we pronounce your name? That's, that's close enough. <laughs> close enough, and we have to be able to spell it uh, close enough also because the judge, the Honorable Judge Ahmad, is a, um, a current seated judge, and um, I'm going to tell you, she's doing a write-in candidacy for, for this uh, position that she's running for, and it's a very controversial topic that we're talking about uh, because there are a number of things that's happening with this particular race. So I want you to pay close attention. Welcome to today's show. Thank you, Captain Marks. And so honored to be here. Thank you and so good much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, just let's get right to it. First, I want to talk about your background because you you are a current judge and you're running for a different position for judge, or, or is it the same position? It's um, I'm running for the position of judge. Uh, let me just explain. I was appointed judge by the Illinois Supreme Court two years ago in December of 2014 to fill the vacancy left by um, retired Judge Cynthia Brim, and so I'm appointed to the Brim vacancy. However, I'm running for judge, as you indicated so well, as a write-in candidate for the Hopkins judicial vacancy. So it's still a circuit court judge position, it's just a, a different vacancy for circuit court judge. Now before we talk about this particular race, that you're in. I want to talk about your background because I understand that you uh, you you have quite a background in in the, the uh, industry of law. You are yes, currently a judge. Uh, you've been a sexual harassment officer for the city of Chicago. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> Assistant That's public correct. defender right. uh, for the law office of the Cook County Public Defenders. A special assistant to the president on diversity at DePaul University, as well as assistant dean of multicultural. 
Affairs at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Her education includes a, um, a Jewish doctorate degree uh, from DePaul University and as well as a master's from Bucknell University. Um, Correct. You can find a lot of information about the judge if you go online and just Google her name. Yes. Speaking of your name, yes. you know, um, a lot of people are going to have a problem writing in this candidacy, uh, write, writing in your name. I don't think so. Well, no. In fact, uh, I've met plenty of people who've had no problem at all writing it in. Well, okay, maybe uh, and, it's and, just me. Uh, well, <laughs> fortunately, we have a lot of information as to how to spell my name. It's, uh, as I uh, explained, like the Old Testament Maryam, M-A-R-Y-A-M. It's spelled just like it sounds, so fortunately that's really easy. And um, Ahmad, A-H-M-A-D. And for those of your viewers who um, are football fans, they're, they're familiar with the former football player Ahmad Rashad, and it's spelled the same way. Wow. So Ahmad is not an uncommon name, and fortunately, phonetically, it too is easy to spell. Very good. What if a person misspells your name on the write-in write -in ballot? Well, fortunately, um, Illinois law states that what determines whether or not a write-in vote counts is voter intent. So those who are viewing the votes would look at what's written, and if it contains enough letters for them to determine that the voter meant me, that vote counts. So it does not have to be spelled correctly. And um, the other important fact is there, I'm the only write-in candidate. Mm. So um, it's either you're attempting to spell my name or another name. If it's another name, obviously, that wouldn't count. If it's Susie Jones, it's not going to count. Um, but if you get some of those letters, it will count. Well, you say that you're the only write-in candidate, but you know, I was taking a look. For was, judge. Oh, I'm the only, okay. I, and I specifically say that. I'm the only write-in candidate for judge. Um, there are other write-in candidates throughout the ballot. Yes, I, I see that there's about 15. But I am the only president. one for judge. And if you at look the, at the very bottom, you there see you go. circuit court judge and my name. Okay. So that's how you know, in fact, if you live in the first sub-circuit. If you go to position 94 on your ballot, the first sub-circuit ballot, there's a line under the judges that has write-in. What geographical area does the first sub-circuit cover? That's a cover? very good question. Um, the, the, the general lines of the first sub-circuit are 73rd Street to the north, all the way south to South Holland. And the dividing line is the Dan Ryan and the Bishop Ford Expressway. So Interstate 94 for ballot position 94. So that'll help your, your viewers make the connection as to which position it is on the ballot. And then the area or the territory east of the Dan Ryan all the way to the lake. So this, this, these areas include not only the south side of Chicago, um, including Inglewood, it includes Dalton, Calumet City, Calumet Park, Burnham, and the eastern portion of South Holland that's east of the Bishop Ford Express. I see. So that, that covers quite a, a large area. Yes. Now tell me, why do you, why do you have the audacity to hope? Uh, that's a line I stole from the president. <laughs> <book, of> <laughs> but why do you have the audacity to hope that you could possibly win a write-in candidacy? First of all, I have faith in the people of Cook County, that the people of Cook County want to be represented by officials who are ethical and in this case with, with the judge position, know the law and possess a firm understanding of the law. And that's the kind of background I have. I've been a judge for two years, as I say, a real judge for two years. Uh, I preside in criminal court. Additionally, I have been found highly qualified or qualified by every single bar association. Bar associations are comprised of groups of lawyers. So the members of my profession have found me highly qualified or qualified to be a judge. You were also recommended in addition by the Chicago Tribune and other papers. Yes, that's correct. The um, Every single endorsement 
that a candidate can receive, I have received at one time or but another. But didn't your opponent get any endorsements? How did she get on the ballot? Well, um, when she ran in the primary, she ran against a seated judge, and the seated judge against whom she ran actually had all of the endorsements and, and, and the bar ratings. Yeah. However, he did not win the primary. And the only reason, there's the only reason I'm submitting my credentials to the public as a write-in candidate is because of the legal situation that my opponent has found herself in. But for that, I would not have um, felt the desire to run as a write-in candidate. But seeing that she would have um, difficulties um, because of the legal issues she was facing, I knew that, but for, for um, her legal problems, that position would be vacant on the ballot. I and see. I did not want to see that position to remain vacant and the voters not having an option to vote for a viable candidate from their community. From their community. And you happen to live on the South Side as I well. I do. I do. I live in mm -hmm. the heart of the South Side. I live um, between Park Manor and Chatham. Um, and the area I live in is very much the community. If you know where the old Army and Lou's restaurant is, that's my neighborhood. Very good. If you've just joined us, my name is Captain Mark Stevenson. Seated next to me is the Honorable Judge Marion Ahmad. Thank you. <laughs> and I want to make sure that you know that this is a live call-in talk show. You can join in and give your questions or your comments and we'd love to hear from you. Right now, we have a caller. Welcome to today's show. What's your truth? Good evening. Enjoying the show and the erudite discussion. Oh, hello, sir. And, and I just wanted to salute our jurist for such a heroic effort in, uh, in the current election because the judicial ballot, even without a writing, is so baffling to me. And I've been voting since 1960 in the John F. Kennedy versus Nixon. And oh every goodness. time I get to the, to the judicial part, I really feel I'm almost like in Alice in Wonderland. I need oh some palm cards and everybody a suggestion sheet from newspapers it, and in fact to me I just wish maybe after this election we could revisit the whole quagmire in general but for you personally I salute your efforts in, in believing that you know our, our, our voting public is smart enough to pick up a pen and just write your name in and I, I salute you really for that and thank you uh, Mark, for the uh, show tonight, because you, you're keeping in your uh, usual tradition of an informed electorate is the best safeguard for democracy. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have a question, sir? Yes, that uh, on on the what is the actual procedure? And and on a, with an electronic machine, how do you write? It? How do you write in? Excellent question, sir. So if you go to position 94 on the ballot, you will see my opponent's name. And below her name is a line. And that line simply says, write in. Write in. If That's you, simple. If you click on that line with the stylus that they give you to, to punch in your votes, if you click on that line, a keyboard pops up. And then you can type in my name on the keyboard. It's really easy. And, sir, I'll share a story. A gentleman came out of one of the polling places on Monday and said to me, Judge, you tell everybody I'm 90 years old. And if a 90-year-old man can figure <laughs> out how to write in your name, no one else has an excuse not to do it. I, thank you so much, Your Honor, as thank I you. said. And that is so simple that even I, with uh, GED, and take a shot at Amen. Like Thank you for your <laughs> call. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right, bye. Your Honor, um, I, I really want to ask you some, some questions about um, your motivation and so forth. Mm -hmm. But what really motivated you? I, I, I know that I, I looked up in, in the Tribune, I looked up one day and mm -hmm. I saw that there was a lady who was a, a, an attorney. Um, and she put on a judge's robe and heard some cases. If I did that, I'd probably be in jail. How come she's not? Well, um, as a sitting judge, 
I can't comment about any investigations that are ongoing. Oh, this such is as an ongoing investigation. Such as the situation, now. yes, because of the um, pending felony charge and the um, license investigation. So I well, can't I can't comment other than to say that um, the judiciary has to be held to a higher standard. I see. Because we enact, we, we're the ones who are responsible for meeting out justice and following the laws. And um, you, you know what standard the public is held to and your example and, and your hypothetical shows that you have an understanding. Of I have an understanding of, real of, clear of, of that if I showed up in a courtroom with a robe and got up on the bench and uh, acted like I was a judge, I know that um, this ex-offender would be a current offender. <laughs> I know, I, but I want to read something from the okay. Chicago Tribune okay. pertaining to this. It says, I quote, the race for this seat on the bench has been controversial since August when Crawford, that's the person who sat on the bench and pretended to be a judge, Crawford allegedly put on a judge's robe and heard at least three traffic cases in the Markham courtroom of Judge Valerie Turner. The cases had to be reheard. And uh, that was done earlier this month. Crawford, a law clerk and staff attorney for Chief Judge Timothy Evans, was then fired. Turner was uh, reassigned to administrative duties that did not include hearing cases. Now, that was uh, a, a judge that allowed someone else to sit on the bench in her courtroom. How come that judge? Oh, you can't comment on because that. Because of the, but how the come, investigation. Then you tell me, folks, how come that judge cannot be be charged with allowing someone to be on there? We have another caller. Welcome to today's show. What's your truth? Caller, are you there? Oh, we lost we'll, the keep okay. we'll keep going. Okay, we'll keep going. I wanted to ask uh, uh, questions about uh, you as a judge, okay. and, and I know you have to be careful at the way that you answer some of these questions, but, uh, but I, I represent a group of ex-offenders and people in recovery from substance abuse who are trying to rebuild their lives, Your Honor. Okay. I too, yes, take a look. If you look real close, there's an X on my back too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I have to make sure that I'm giving accurate information. I want to know, do you think that the law, as it stands right now, you've been a criminal mm -hmm. judge. Mm -hmm. Does it apply to equally to all citizens? I can't give you my opinion about the application of the law. All I can do is tell you what I do as a judge and what every judge is supposed to do, which is follow the law. And I will say that's why it's important that we elect judges. When we have the chance to elect judges, that you elect judges who come from the communities that are represented in the courtrooms. Hmm. Because when you take that oath to become a judge, not only do you follow the law, you take an oath to follow the law, but you get to bring your life experiences in the courtroom with you. Oh, and so you, as voters, have to have a richly diverse judiciary because you need people who are coming into court, who are making decisions, who are in touch with the community and who are familiar with everything that happens within communities, particularly those that are represented in the courtrooms. But we've been taught that mm -hmm. the police enforce the law. The politicians like senators and congressmen and state representatives formulate and write the law. Okay. And judges interpret the law. That's correct. So when, when a judge hears a case, you, you have uh, boundaries is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. you, you tell me that you have maximum and minimum sentences. Correct. And being a judge allows you to use that leverage to give a harsh or a lenient sentence. So when, when a judge is giving a sentence, you have the sentencing guidelines as you so well articulated which involve minimum sentences and maximum, right? Yes. And so 
as a judge, you have to not only look at the sentencing guidelines, you have to look at the facts and circumstances of the case and weigh information about that defendant and his or her history and okay. background. And all of those factors factor into the type of sentence that's meted out. So that that is what prevents cookie cutter sentences, hmm. right? That's uh, but, speaking but, from a seat of experience. But I'm telling <laughs> you, the the electorate, the the viewers, the voters have to be vigilant in making sure that the people on the bench have the background, knowledge, and experience in addition to the legal experience. Because I'm going to tell you, if you don't as a judge, have, have a knowledge of the law, hmm. you cannot dispense justice and you certainly cannot correct injustice. Okay. Because you don't know the law. Well, so you have to know the law and then have the experience, the life experience and the community experience, I would tell you. We have another caller, but okay. first I want to ask this. Okay. Your Honor, why should the people vote for you? Don't, don't look at me. Look into the camera and tell them what's the real truth. I'm looking at you because you're sitting next to me, just so we're clear. <laughs> but in terms of voting for me, because of what I'm articulating, yes. living where I live, the experience that I bring to the bench, um, in addition to having been an assistant Cook County public defender, I was also an assistant state's attorney for Cook County. Hmm. So I'm one of the few judges in Cook County who's a criminal court judge who has worked as a public defender and a state's attorney. Why is that important? Because I know both sides. Wow. I know what defense attorneys are supposed to do for their clients. I know that the state's attorneys are charged with pursuing justice, not convictions. And, and that they have a burden the state's attorneys have a burden that they have to be held to. I see. It's, and so that's a balance. That, that involves a balance between victims' rights and defendants' rights. We want to take another caller. Welcome to today's show. Come on with it. What's Come your truth? It. Welcome, caller. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Yes, hello. Up me? Wake up. Wake up. Ask your question. Come on. We're running out of time. Hello, sir. I guess I, I scared. Hello. Oh, yes, we're here. Hello. If you're there, ask your question or give your comment. Me? I'm Alan. I'm Captain Al. My battery is dying. Oh, boy. Oh, his battery ah, is dying. Okay. Battery. So oh. sorry about that. Uh, please, um, we'll have to hear from you next week. That was uh, that was someone that I know, okay. Captain Allen, who is also a maritime attorney. Okay. And um, I really want to want to hear his question. However, let's see if we can answer this one. Why do you think that the United States has the highest incarceration on Earth? We have about 1.4 million or so, give or take. A couple hundred thousand. <laughs> we we have a lot of people incarcerated. Why do you think that we have such a high cost incarceration rate? And and when I looked at the the sample ballot today, Your Honor, mm -hmm. all I saw was Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. Mm -hmm. And this is who we've been putting in office. We 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 have throughout Cook County, we have all Democratic judges, just about every one. So the Democrats are the ones that are giving out these sentences and filling up these jails. Well, I can't answer your question about incarceration, why our rate is any different from anyone else's. I don't know that ours is higher than any other nation because that's, that's not my area of expertise, and I'll allow somebody who has the proper expertise to answer You're sitting next to one. I study this. All right. Then you can answer that question because <laughs> uh, that's beyond my expertise. Okay. Okay. Um, and tell me that if we put your name on the ballot. If you write me in. because we I'm, write I'm your name on the ballot. Position is it really gonna? Is it really going to count? How do I know that my voice, my, my vote's going to really count? It count. will count if you take the time to write it in. And I'm just asking the voters just to take it. It takes a minute, if that, to type in my name. Very and, good. And that's to ensure that that position, the Hopkins Judicial Vacancy, it's filled and filled with a qualified candidate. With the last candidate. few seconds we have left. Go ahead and 
tell the folks again, why should they vote for you very quickly? I'm please. very proud to serve the, Cook, the people of Cook County as a judge and, and um, as of now to serve them as a criminal court judge. And um, I hope to have the opportunity to do that beyond November 8th. And my name is Mariam Ahmad, M-A-R-Y-A-M-A-H-M-A-D. This is position 94 on your ballot. And I'm asking you click on that line and write me in. Thank you. Very good, very good. We want to thank you for tuning in. Sorry we ran a little bit over. I want to thank Ed and Lou Tarver, our producers, and Sylvia Snowden and Amari, uh, as well as Michael Jacobson, our program director. And Michael, I got to tell you, don't quit your day job, Michael. You don't know anything about baseball whatsoever. You chose that. To, you chose that the Cubs was going to go down. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you might want to consider going back to Cleveland. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Mama, get the coffee ready. The kid's on his way.